And welcome to High School Physics Explained. And this is my video on how well do you know? And today I'm going to talk about gravitation. So let's have a look at the first question. As with any of these videos on How Well You Know series, it's worthwhile to stop the video and have an attempt at the question before you proceed with the solution. So here's the first question. Which of the following diagrams correctly represents the forces acting on a satellite in a stable circular orbit around the Earth? So the thing about gravity is to understand that a satellite that goes around the Earth undergoes centripetal motion and undergoes centripetal forces. But those centripetal forces are provided by the gravitational force. In other words, Fc is actually equal to Fg. But they're the only forces acting actually on the satellite. An object actually is trying to continue in a straight line, but because of the gravitational force, it accelerates towards the center. That's the whole nature of centripetal motion. So any forces that are tangential to the motion are actually incorrect. There is no forward propulsion on satellites. So this propulsion force isn't actually a situation in play. The only time there may be a propulsion force is if the satellite is moving to either a higher orbit or a lower orbit. Since this is a stable circular orbit, therefore this is removed. So that automatically discounts B and discounts A. A, a, f a common fallacy is an idea that there is some sort of force forcing a satellite to go out. Now that's incorrect because the fact is, is if I will remove any forces acting on the satellite, then the object will continue to move in the direction that it was traveling at. So for example, let's say I suddenly remove the centripetal force pulling the satell satellite in. The tendency is therefore for the object to continue with the remaining forces. Now, it doesn't go off in this direction, but it actually continues horizontally because this is the only force acting. So this force actually isn't actually existing. So therefore, there is no such thing as a reactive force. Hence, the only possible answer is D. And as I stated to you before, the gravitational force is a centripetal force. So if the examiner here wanted to label this instead of Fg, but labeled it as Fc, that this would still be correct. Two masses have a gravitational force of 12 newtons between them. If the distance between the masses is doubled, what would be the new gravitational force between them? Okay, this is a fairly simple question. And again, to understand is that the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the distance between those masses squared. Now, gravitational force can actually be calculated by the fact that this is if this is proportional, then this divided by this should give us a constant, and that is our gravitational constant. So we have here our gravitational formula. You don't actually need to know g at this case for this question, because it tells you that the normal force between two masses is 12 newtons. And then it says if the distance between the masses is doubled, so the masses stay the same, what will be the new gravitational force? Well, if the distance doubles, then the gravitational force is going to firstly decrease because we have it here on the denominator. But it's a squared relationship. So instead of doubling the distance and causing a halving of the gravitational force, it's squared. So therefore, instead of half, it is a quarter. 12 divided by 4, it's a quarter of the, of the actual value, and gives us 3 newtons, and therefore the answer is A. Here we have two masses, and a line here that represents the distance away from the center of masses. And so this shows two planets, X and Y, of mass M and 4M. And it asks you, at the distance D from the center Y, the acceleration due to gravity is 4 meters per second squared. So this is over here, 4 meters per second squared, as far as the acceleration due to gravity is concerned. Now, g is derived by understanding that the weight of an object is actually the gravitational force. So mg is equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. 
So this mass and this mass cancel. And so the acceleration due to gravity of any object around a mass is equal to the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the planet in question divided by the distance that the object is away squared. Looking at this question, you can see that this mass is four times heavier. So this is four times heavier than planet X. So therefore, if this is the acceleration due to gravity for mass for planet Y, then the acceleration due to gravity for X, because it is four times lighter, will simply be four times smaller. So therefore, it's equal to one meters per second squared. So now we're looking at satellites in orbit around the planet. The geostationary orbit is um, moving around at a constant speed. Its period, of course, is also um, set by the distance. So if this is my planet over here and my satellite is over here, the period that it has and the velocity that it has is determined by a couple of formulas. The first thing is that the velocity is determined by the square root of gm over r. Now, if you want to know how that is derived, you just need to remember that the centripetal force of any satellite is equal to the gravitational force that exists. And so those two there will give you that formula. So clearly you can see that if I increase the radius, my velocity decreases and vice versa. If the radius gets smaller, my velocity increases. So since we are talking from a geostationary orbit to a low Earth orbit, the radius gets smaller, so the velocity increases. So all of a sudden, we only have two possible answers. But what about the orbital period? Well, the orbital period is determined by the fact of Kepler's third law. And Kepler's third law says that r cubed over t squared is equal to g m1 over 4 pi squared. That is the relationship between r cubed and t squared, that, con that relationship here is a constant value for all objects around a central body whose mass is m. So if I want to increase the radius, then my period has to increase as well. Not at the same rate because of this cubed and squared relationship, but nonetheless, by increasing radius, I increase period, decrease radius, I decrease the period. So therefore, if I bring my satellite to a lower Earth orbit, its orbital period is going to go lower. It'll be much shorter. shorter. So if in that case, lower is the only response there, giving us B. Okay, the gravitational force due to Earth on a mass positioned at X is F of X, and on the same mass positioned at Y is F of Y. And the diagram is shown drawn to scale. What is the value of F of X over F of Y? I'll give you a moment to work it out. Now there's a couple of ways to look at this. So we're looking at the new value for f of x over f of y. So clearly the gravitational force is larger here than over here. So this is larger and this is smaller here because it's closer to the Earth. And so automatically since that f of x and f of y, we're going to get a value here that is going to be a value greater than one. And so far that doesn't exclude any responses whatsoever. The thing to work about out is, is that if I move it from Y to X, what is the change in displacement? So if you can see for movement, the distances here, we've got one, we've got two, we've got three. So really what I've done moving it from Y to X, I've actually decreased the radius by two thirds. And so if I decrease the radius by two thirds, because of the square relationship, you remember that F is proportional to M1, M2 over R squared. Therefore, if I decrease the radius by two thirds, I have to increase the force by not by three over two, or the inverse of that, but three over two squared because of the square relationship. That gives me nine over four, 
or in decimals, that's equal to 2.25. And so the ratio of f of x, which is larger over f of y, is 2.25, so that is c. So that's one way to work this out. Another way to think about it is this, is if I do f of x, and that is equal to g, m1, m2, over r squared. If I do f of y, I get g, m1, m2, over. Now, this r, this distance here, if you look carefully, if this is r, what is this distance over here? Well, that distance is not r, but 3 over 2. So you can see that is this is 1 and a half. So what I can do is I can go 3 over 2 r squared. I then clean this up and I get g m1 m2 over 9 over 4 r squared. Now I do f of x and f of y over each other. And now you can see what I'm going to get is I'm going to have g m1 m2 over r squared all over g m1 m2 over 9 over 4 r squared. Now again, if I clean that up, okay, this all cancels out. So I now have r squared on the bottom over here. But of course, this flips around. So now I get 9 over 4 r squared up the top. These r squareds cancel. And of course, I get 9 over 4 again. So therefore, C. A little bit more difficult, but not extremely difficult. A satellite orbits around the Earth with a period of T, and the identical satellite orbits a planet Xeris, which has a mass four times greater than of Earth. And both satellites have the same orbital radius. What is the period of the satellite around Xeris? Again, this is all about Kepler's third law. And that means r cubed over t squared is g m over 4 pi squared. Now the radius is kept constant, but the mass is actually increased. So if I increase this by a factor of 4, which is the case for Xerus, then what I must do is I increase this by a factor of 4. So in order to do that, I have to actually do t over 2 squared is equal to g m times 4 over 4 pi squared. Now, how did I do that? Well, this is actually half of t. It's a squared value, so it's now a quarter of t squared. But of course, that goes on top to be 4 r cubed over t squared. So you can see there's the full magnification there. So in this case for Xerus, the period is reduced by half. So therefore, B is the answer. And so a final question, we have a question where we are actually determining the gravitational force. Okay, now the gravitational force, of course, is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. Now we already have R. If you look up here, we know that R is equal to 3.8 by 10 to the power of 8 meters. We have the mass of the moon, and that is equal to 7.2 by 10 to the power of 22 kilograms. What we don't have is the mass of the Earth, but what we're given is the value of the velocity of the moon around the Earth, which in this case is 1.0 by 10 to the power of 3 meters per second. So how are we going to solve this problem? Well, the th solve this problem is to understand that the orbital velocity of any object, in this case the moon, is equal to the square root of g m over r. Now this is the m of our planet we're interested in, which is the Earth. So if I rearrange that and clean that up, I end up getting v squared is equal to g m of the Earth over r. And of course, what we want is the mass of the Earth. And so the mass of the Earth is equal to V squared multiplied by R over G. Now, if I now get this value here 
and substitute that in for the mass of the Earth, which is over here, I end up getting this. So the gravitational force, that's the thing we're looking for, is equal to g, the mass of the Moon, multiply the mass of the Earth, but remember that's equal to v squared r, over g, all over r squared. So now I get the gravitational force is equal to the mass of the Moon multiplied by V squared over R. So that gives me 7.2 by 10 to the power of 22 multiplied by 1 by 10 to the power of 3 squared all over R, which is 3.8 by 10 to the power of 8. And that gives me 1.89 by 10 to the power of 20 Newtons. Looking at the responses, because these are all in two significant figures, my answer ends up being in two significant figures, so therefore the answer is B. Well, I hope that's helped you understand gravitation a little bit better. Stay tuned for my next How Well Do You Know series. Bye for now.